Chapter 57 There's a note pushed under the door of the apartment from Chris. I don't want to see him explain why he's left because I don't care what he thought, why he thought he had to leave. I stick it in a drawer and wander the empty hotel. There are traces of him everywhere. But I end up in his studio. He was carving all these new pieces and they are achingly beautiful for being only partially drawn out of the stones. The only finished pieces he left are his whale twin pendants. I weigh them in the palm of my hand, rounded and warm from the sun. They may be the most perfect things he's ever made. Since I know he wouldn't walk away without these unless he never meant to return, I slip the chains around my neck so the two whales click together. Guppy left instructions that she and Teddy were not to be disturbed, but I knock all the same. When she answers, I can't tell her that Chris is gone. Because she looks so sad and happy both at once. Is something wrong, she says. No, just I clear my throat and make my voice cheerful. I wanted to see if you needed anything. Next morning, Jeremy finds me killing plates in the kitchen. In this foul mood, I am the fastest kitchen porter in hotel industry, even on a Saturday morning when I'd rather be in bed. The plates I wash dry themselves instantly to avoid coming in contact with my hands a second time. Thought we were going out this morning, Angel, he says. Chris collects stones from the beach so he can carve them. Oh, he says. Right. He makes the most beautiful whales from them, I say. I take off the pendants. He made these. He turns them round in his hand, feeling their weight and perfection. The man has a gift, says Jeremy. Yeah. Angelica. He gave me binoculars when I was eight so I could see the whales properly. His binoculars weighed a ton and I was small, see. Didn't start growth spreading until I was 11. I was the same, he says, which was only three years ago. I'm not interested right now in whatever reminiscences he has to offer. Chris has always been really protective of us. He took me fishing and he doesn't even like fishing. We get lots of whales here because they like the warmth of the Gulf Stream. And that's the coolest name for water because it makes me think of where it's been. And it sounds like gulp, like the whales are gulping because they swim so hard to get here, here to Drishog. I take deep breaths, but not so deep that he has a chance to jump in. He told me when he handed me my binoculars, I've counted seven so far. Aren't they beautiful? What am I trying to say? I'm just saying you should have been nicer to him. No, I'm not. It's too late for that. You could have told him to stay. You could have told him we still need him here. It was his decision, says Jeremy, and he's right. There isn't a role for him now brain freeze. It's as if a thunderbolt of pure ice had hit the back of my neck. For a minute I can't breathe or gulp or anything. Then it thaws. I look at Jeremy and it all makes sense. I know what I was trying to say. I know what I have to do. Mum, I was looking for you everywhere. She's making beds, but something in my voice makes her stop. Have you been crying? I shake my head. She takes my hands. What is it with parents and hands? They're always taking your hands as if that makes everything okay, as if this shows us that they know best when they don't know anything at all. You were meant to be the first person I told about the engagement, she says. It all happened so fast. She fiddles with my fingers. I mean, I hadn't actually really decided until Chris came barging in and then you were there and I saw it made sense. Why isn't she making eye contact? Why does my mum's smile feel false? Why talk about sense when she should be talking about love? I'm sorry, she says. I know it came as a shock. I pull my hands away. Chris has left. That's his choice, she says, quietly and goes back to plumping pillows. She just doesn't get it. No, it's not. Sometimes it's as if she is being deliberately dim. He left because of you. Oh, Angelica, she says, I know you're very fond of Chris, but oh, mum, he loves you. Chris loves you. Insert. Mums don't know how to listen. Oh, they pretend to, but then so do dogs and cats and seagulls if you have food in your hand. That sounds worse than I meant it to. I'm not saying mums are like cats or dogs or seabirds. They're much more difficult because you expect them to listen. You want them to hear you, but half the time they don't. Chris says it's the difference between listening and hearing. We're all great at the second, but most of us are lousy at the first. Then there's the interrupting with their own problems or question or the solution to the problem you haven't even finished explaining. So they get it wrong anyway. And sometimes we just want to bend, OK? Or talk things over without getting their wisdom in return.
In romantic films, me saying this to mum would be enough. She, as the heroine, would rush out of the hotel, steal a motorbike, find her man on the brink of signing his soul over to the Foreign Legion or the devil, and the two would embrace for life. I must have imagined this a thousand times. Maybe Chris has already broken down by the side of the road, so it wouldn't even take her long to find him. No, says mum. Your father and I, do you love him? Do you love Jeremy? We have you, she says, and the hotel. He has great ideas about developing. Wrong answer. It's a building, Mum. You can't make choice about who you live with because they like a building. You can't choose who you'll be with on the basis of their relationship to me or because of what you used to feel or because it makes sense. You don't even know him. Not anymore. What's got into you? She says. Does he make your eyes shine? Or your skin? Yeah. Does he make your skin glow? Come on, Aunt Jack, I think faster, think faster. Make her listen to you before it's too late. Does your heart beat faster every time you hear his name? Genius. Mum doesn't seem to be able to answer. So I know I'm right. I take off Chris's pendants. One whale, I say, has MM on the back. Molly Moon. The other has CW for Chris Webber and they fit together. She doesn't want to take it, but I make her hold it. I wait for Chris's magic to do its work. Which is very sweet, she says, but I've made my decision. We're a family angel. You, your dad and me. She hands the pendants back, but her fingers are shaking. We should have been from the start, and he, we, both recognise that now. Jeremy, Jeremy is not Rick, Mum, I say quietly. He can't be. I have her attention now. Her complete and undivided attention. It's pretty scary when you have your mum's complete and undivided attention. Especially when you're about to confess, confess something you know she's going to hate worse than marzipan. What do you mean, she says. I'm by the window, staring, out as, far to the, uh, staring as far out to sea as I can, hoping the waves will gift me courage. There's a bare horizon, nothing for miles, not even a basking whale. It's as if they all left with Chris. Angelica? I'm not being dramatic. Some things are just hard to admit. He can't be Rick because Rick doesn't exist. Then I walk out. Jeremy is on his way upstairs and I push past. Hey, what's the hurry, Munchkin, he says. I don't respond. To be continued.